Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to start the work of this conference with this first round table with very eminent specialists. So, uh, Mr. Gary Kasparov, whom I do not need probably to present in detail because everybody knows him. And I'm happy uh, to say that uh, I know Gary for many years when he still lived in Moscow. And uh, I think that among uh, Russian op opponents, the Putin regime, he is uh, uh, probably the most influent and uh, the most uh, brilliant probably also. Uh, so today he publishes uh, the site Kasparov went through and also he has a, a foundation for human rights. Uh, he's uh, of course an advocate of uh, Ukraine. Um, now on my left, I have Professor Andrei Novak, who is a prominent specialist of Russia, of Russian history, of Russian-Polish uh, relations, and uh, he is uh, teaching at the Jagiellon University. And uh, here is uh, uh, Daniel Fried, uh, who is uh, a very important figure, was for years a very important figure uh, in uh, American diplomacy. Uh, he is uh, a big specialist uh, of Russia, advisor to the White House for many years in different positions. And also he's uh, what is very important, one may call him Mr. Sanctions, <laughs> because he was uh, coordinating American sanctions <coughs> with uh, sanctions of other uh, Western countries. So I think we are, uh, we are all qualified uh, to, to discuss uh, of the very important questions. And probably we shall try, I will put this question and maybe three of you will try to answer it, uh, uh, each one speaking uh, for several minutes. Then I maybe uh, uh, ask other questions and then we give the word uh, to, uh, to, to all the people here present. Um, I just wanted to know, maybe, maybe Laura uh, can tell me, uh, we started later than it was uh, announced, now it is uh, uh, already uh, 12 uh, hours. Uh, should we stop at one o'clock or not, or we can go further? We have the flexibility, so we uh, will try uh, not to be, uh, not to be too long because everybody will want to have lunch. <laughs> but maybe one hour won't be enough. Uh, so uh, the first question will be: What are the deep reasons of this aggression? How come that one country in the twenty-first century attacks another sovereign country? Uh, whereas uh, Europe lived in peace for uh, practically uh, almost eight decades. Um, and what, uh, how it is related, this aggression, to the perception of Ukraine by the Russian regime? Uh, star start with Gary. Okay, thank you, Galina. I'm grateful for Techno Foundation for having us here today and uh, um, spending the whole uh, conference on, uh, on this very important issue um, and uh, offering all, us all of us opportunity to, to, to discuss not only the current affairs but also the roots of, of these tragic events. Uh, the question is how far would like to go? How far down in history? Uh, I can even mention that this year is 400 years since the first Roman of Tsar Mikhail published a decree in 1622 uh, demanding to burn all New Testaments in Ukrainian. 
But I don't think it's that relevant because you know, we can start looking at these 400 years and we will find that almost every uh, Tsar had a certain, and, and, and the head of the Communist Party, so they had certain um, regulations, degrees, uh, prob plans to uh, diminish Ukrainian um, nation, uh, attack the language, and to make sure that Ukraine will never have its statehood. Again, this is very, very deep in the roots. But I think we probably should look at the event starting in 1991, collapse of the Soviet Union. And, um, and it's, no, it's not only uh, Soviet leaders you know, that, that wanted Ukraine to stay in. We all remember the famous, or I would say infamous speech of Bush 41 uh, in summer 1991 that was called Chicken Kiev, where he warned about uh, Ukrainian nationalism and, and the danger of Ukraine leaving Soviet Union and thus basically dooming, uh, uh, making this, making this, this uh, Soviet empire doom. Um, okay, they didn't listen. They, they walked away. And in 1991, uh, uh, Kravchuk, the, the then president of, of Ukraine, and uh, um, Boris Yeltsin and uh, then president of Belarus, Shushkevich, they signed the treaty basically dismantling the Soviet Union. And it was peaceful. And I think we're all celebrating that the collapse of the Soviet Union was so peaceful. Because we saw a year later what happened in Yugoslavia. So, uh, and um, I have to say I was one of those who's, who celebrated it, saying, look at Boris Yeltsin. He just, you know, he, he let Ukraine go. He let Belarus go. He just, uh, he dismantled Soviet empire and no, okay, not, there, there was a bloodshed. And uh, it, by the way, it's happened everywhere where Stalin uh, left his uh, landmines, you know, jubilee landmines, changing, changing territories and shifting, you know, nations, mostly in North Caucasus. And also we had problems in, in, um, in, in uh, Transnistria. But, and that's probably worth, uh, worth uh, mentioning, there was not a single complaint about Ukraine. Oh, there were some marginal Russian politicians talking about Crimea. But the uniqueness of this war is that unlike any other war, and we look, you can look at the worst cases, like Hitler attacking Poland, or uh, Saddam Hussein annexing Kuwait. I'm not here to defend this, this barbaric acts of aggression, but they all made diplomatic preparations. Hitler talked about dancing corridor, uh, obviously about Sudetland. Saddam Hussein talked about British imperialism, uh, taking part of, of sovereign Iraqi territory. The uniqueness of this war that not a single Russian government since 1991, and we're talking about Boris Yeltsin, uh, Putin, then you remember the name Medvedev? This, 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 this man that you know, uh, just uh, sitting in the middle, you know, just warming chair for Putin. Uh, then Putin again for a year. Every Russian parliament never, never made a single call for return of so-called Russian historic Russian territories. So the annexation of Crimea happened just overnight with zero diplomatic preparation, which makes I think it's absolutely unique. But going back to the 90s. I think they were already could see the seeds of these problems. Uh, the young, because Russia, people ask me, how come? When you look at war today, and uh, it, it's most of the, or most of the action uh, is happening in Eastern Ukraine. Most of people who live there, they are many of the ethnic Russians. Most of them speak Russian. So we can even call it civil war because it's, you know, both sides, you know, they, 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 they speak the same, the same tongue. And many of them were born, you know, just on the other side of the, illusionary border, uh, for instance, Kharkiv or Belgorod, 100 miles difference, same language, read same newspapers. So uh, um, what, was, what was the difference? Why, you know, why the Ukrainians, and that's Putin's biggest miscalculation, why Ukrainians or Russian Ukrainians living, living on the other side of the border defending their country and not showing any willingness to, to, to uh, be subdued by Putin? And I think probably it goes all the way back to 1994. Because democracy, as we found out, is not just, you know, oh, elections. A key, you know, element of success of any democracy is a peaceful transit of power. And that's what separated Russia and Ukraine back in 1994. In 1994, Leonid Kravchuk, the first Ukrainian president, lost elections to Leonid Kuchma and walked away. In 1994, Yeltsin regime started war in Chechnya to find a good reason for Yeltsin to stay in power. So I think that's already created a very different um, mindset for Russians and, 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 and Ukrainians. Because ever since, 
1994. Ukrainians did not want anyone to impose their will on them. So they resisted, you know, the first attempts of Putin's regime to put uh, uh, Yanukovych in place in 2004. Then there was another Maidan, two Maidans. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's now the, 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 the mood of the nation. It's our sovereign rights to elect our leaders. In Russia, unfortunately, we moved in the opposite direction. We basically saw the, the recreation of the worst practices uh, of, of the communist regime, KGB, and also mafia state. And um, as for this war, you know, I've been shouting about this war being imminent for many, many years for a simple reason. I l listened to Putin. I didn't, I didn't have a, a crystal ball. I didn't pretend to be Nostradamus. I just listened to Putin. And he was very specific. First, you know, in general, it's not me. Putin kept saying the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Is it clear? Oh, he didn't have the same, um, the sa the, the same um, powers when he said it first time. But it was very clear that he had it already in his mind. In 2007, in, in, uh, in Munich, at the security conference, looking in the eye, into the eyes of the leaders of the free world, Vladimir Putin bluntly said, go back to 1997 borders, NATO. And he made it very clear next year in, in, Buc in Bucharest, uh, so at, 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 at the summit, or NATO summit, that he would not tolerate, you know, Ukrainian Republic of Georgia, so being admitted to, 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 to the organization. And it's, he didn't just say that, he backed his words with action, attacking Republic of Georgia. And by the way, European Union was very busy trying to, to, to spread the blame. It's, I should probably remind people about Talialini Commission that spent m m weeks and months trying to find a reason to blame Saakashvili, you know, not to have a full blame on Putin. And then, you know, just step by step, you know, he just moved on and, uh, and just tested the water. And, uh, and 2014 was just, you know, it's a great opportunity the way he saw it. And what's happened after, after annexation of Crimea? The answer is nothing. Something that was called sanctions by Obama, President Obama or European leaders, it was like a mosquito bite. So we, in less than five months, European Union already worked out six packages of sanctions and they're working on the seventh now. They're talking about some uh, greatest changes in, in their rules, you know, about as, you know, seizing Russian assets, frozen assets. What they did for eight years, nothing. Nothing. And I don't have to mention that, you know, France and Germany s was still supplying Russia with, with military-grade equipment over these years, not Ukraine. So um, when people say Putin, whether Putin was crazy or Putin, you know, made a mistake, the answer is, no, he was not crazy. He was very logical in, in his, you know, world. All he knew is that the free world offered no opposition to his acts. So why did he, why, why we thought he had to expect the, the something else? Oh, his only mistake was that every dictator made before him is he underestimated the will of free people and their willingness uh, to die for, for, for their motherland uh, and, and for, for freedom. And uh, the, when they failed taking over Kiev in three or four days as he planned, so the war changed its ways. But it's, uh, again, for eight years since annexation of Crimea, Russian propaganda kept talking about war on Ukraine as something, it's almost fait accompli. It, would, it was a matter of time. When we re retake back our, our lands, Ukraine state is not a real one. The interesting thing is that they always change the reason. You know, it's, it's, it's not just, oh, it's NATO to come too close. This is the, the flying time for NATO missiles. Yes, but Estonia was a member, member of, of NATO from 2004. And the distance from Estonia to St. Petersburg was much closer than from Kiev to Moscow. So then they changed the reason again. But, but what was important is they always, you know, pushed one idea for eight years. And again, I've been listening to their propaganda. And they were very consistent. The war would come. And again, that's what we saw. That is just, you know, Putin tested, tested again the Western leaders. He waited until the Nord Stream 2 was opened. That's also important. That's to, to secure, as he thought, his you know, gas supply to Europe. He had few, uh, three meetings with President Biden, one uh, in person, two, uh, two on video, and he was convinced that nobody would move. So he was, he was wrong, but unfortunately, again, this, is this, this war is very much, you know, has deep imperial roots, but also it's the, it's the attempt to take revenge uh, on, on, the, on the loss of the, of the Cold War. And uh, 
I always call Putin an existential threat for, uh, for our values, for, for our civilization, for a simple reason. He does not want to live in a world, as, as Prime Minister said you know, very eloquently, in the world where you know, our values are dominant. He doesn't live in a world with consensus, compromise. It's about, you know, I'm the law. So that's why his favorite historical um, analogs, Joseph Stalin and Ivan the Terrible, not even Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, because they could impose their will and be above the law. So I think the war was imminent, and uh, it's now, while discussing the, the roots, we should also you know, find a way to make sure that this war will be the last war of Russian Empire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, I think we should uh, try to, 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 to make a better understanding uh, of uh, this hatred uh, which governs Putin's action. Because uh, one seems to see when watching him on the TV that it is something deeply personal, this hatred. And uh, s definitely this hatred has some historical rules. On one hand, for tens of years during the Soviet period, Ukrainians were considered as a little brother, but brother. And now there is question of totally destroying Ukraine and totally destroying the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian identity. And so my question is for Andrei Novak, why this hatred? Where does it come from? How to explain it? Because it's something which seems almost existential. Thank you so much for this question and thank you for the organizers for, uh, for this wonderful occasion to, to be here for me. It's a great honor for me. And in the spirit of the, the good, uh, good patron of, of uh, these meetings, I would like uh, to concentrate on the issue of freedom, which is, uh, or liberty, if you will, uh, which is uh, the key answer for, for your question. But before I will go to that, uh, that main uh, idea, I want to start from something very personal as regards Putin's reasons for this hatred you are asking uh, for. Um, first, it is uh, his uh, Christian name, Volodymyr or Vladimir. To whom this name should belong? Vladimir should be the name of Russia. This is something personal in the very name of Putin. Of course, it is not very important, but it is symbolic. And that's why it a little bit matters. Uh, Vladimir, or Vladimir, as you know, uh, was the, the uh, Kievian Rus uh, mm, uh, Grand Duke who uh, baptized his country. And it is obviously an important uh, uh, moment in the history. Uh, Putin uh, made a symbol uh, from this rivalry for uh, Vladimir Volodymyr already in 2016 when he erected a great uh, monument to Vladimir in Moscow, near the Kremlin. Because uh, for many decades, actually almost two centuries, there is another symbol of Kiev, uh, monument to Volodymyr, uh, Vladimir, uh, uh, looking uh, at the Dnieper River from the very center of Kiev. But of course, uh, in order to understand that hatred, you don't only go to the name of uh, Putin, but you should go also to the historical reasons, uh, which I would like to uh, develop slightly after a wonderful introduction by Mr. Gary Kasparov. Uh, to make it short, I would use just this one term, Ruski Mir. This is the key term it needs to be translated because it's, it has double meaning. Ruski Mir means, of course, Russian world, but at the same time, Russian peace, Pax Rossica. And in these two dimensions, this term describes not only hatred towards Ukrainians, but also contempt towards the West. These two elements are the key uh, elements of uh, understanding Putin's politics. Uh, the first one, uh, hatred towards Ukrainians, is uh, connected with the concept of Ruski Mir as Russian world. 
Putin uh, several times reused an old Tsarist imperial term of Russian triune nation, meaning of course Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, uh, but all the three as branches of one great Russian nation. And he uses these phrases on many important uh, occasions. So I absolutely agree with uh, Gary Kasparov. You need to read Putin and to listen to Putin if you want to understand what he will do, not only what he is doing, but what he will do. Everything is written there. Uh, he uh, identified the problem with Ukraine already in 2008, right after Munich conference, which was mentioned by uh, Mr. Gary Kasparov. Already in February 2008, Putin stated that uh, Ukraine is not even a state. This is a, a, an exact quotation from Putin. And that modern Ukraine was created by Russia. Uh, both these phrases would be reused several times after 2008. But what is also interesting is the fact that at the same moment, February 2008, Vladimir Putin, uh, just ending his second term as president and hosting the last visitor from the West, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk, offered him a partition of Ukraine, uh, which was revealed six years later by Foreign Minister of Poland, Radosław Sikorski. Um, so that meant uh, exactly both uh, meanings uh, that, that alluded to both meanings of the concept of Ruski Emir. Ukraine becomes a problem because it doesn't want to be uh, an element of three un Russian nations. So it could be divided and if we find partners for this division, then we can uh, confirm our contempt to these partners, to Western partners. Uh, that was, of course, uh, only a trick, uh, I would say, to divide uh, Poland and Ukraine, to use maybe any commentary uh, given by Polish Prime Minister. Fortunately, he did not give any. Uh, but the concept of dividing what you can swallow altogether is an important element in Russian politics, dividing with Western partners. Beginning with Poland, then Poland could be divided with another partner from the West, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, uh, so to speak, strategy was uh, more developed in Putin's words in his two uh, very extensive historical essays, 9,000 words essay published in National Interest, in uh, June uh, uh, 2020, uh, celebrating 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And another one a year later in July uh, 2021, uh, 7,000 words long essay by Putin again about uh, historical unity of Russian and, uh, Russians and Ukrainians. In both these essays, uh, Putin not only describes once again his concept of three un nation, but also make us readers of this text understanding how he treats those who do not belong to this triune nation. They are fascists, they are not Ukrainians. So he wants to reunite all Ukrainians that would turn into Russians. The rest are fascists, simply. Those who do not accept this triune concept of nation are simply fascists concocted by Western conspiracies, beginning with Grand Duchy of Lithuania, 16th century, through Poland, through Austria in 19th century, uh, Germany, of course, uh, Friedrich Naumann concept of Mittelo Europa, all the way down uh, to uh, the Atlanticist of the 21st century. So this is how this fascist alternative to the only real uh, Russian, actually, Ukraine uh, was created. That's that's uh, Putin's understanding. Uh, so his goal, I believe, in this war is to uh, reunite, uh, according to his logic, uh, as much Ukraine as he can. He understands that he's, he is not capable of taking all of them. So he dehumanizes them, treating uh, those who defend their uh, homes, their families as fascists. At the same time, Putin simply needs 
people needs manpower. He is in dire straits in this regards. When you, when you discuss military aspects, of course I'm no specialist, there are so many wonderful specialists here, but it seems to me the vital problem of Putin. He does not have young people to send to army. Of course, there, has, there are huge reserves in Moscow, in Leningrad, but uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, Petersburg, but I'm using uh, Putin's phrase. Um, uh, but he doesn't want to use them, and he wants more uh, young people from territories that should be reunited, meaning this old concept of Ruski Mir, that Belarusians and Ukrainians are also good for the Russian army. Russian army, which would be necessary for further conquest, for further military confrontations, not just with the West, which is obvious, but also with uh, Central Asiatic rivals, and maybe someday with China, when you have 11 times smaller population than Chinese, and you have a long border with China, even though you pretend you are a great friend of China, you consider this imparity and you try desperately to find people. That's why Putin is doing such a barbaric, uh, is using such a barbaric ancient, I would say, uh, method of capturing people. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are being transferred from occupied territories inside Russia. And this is rational. This is not absurd. This is not only to terrorize the rest of Ukrainians. It is also to procure reserves in the near future, maybe not in this war, but in the next war. Uh, that's why I'm saying that in within the logic of uh, Ruski Mir as a uh, Russian world, a three uh, nation, there is a, a very perverse logic. But let me concentrate towards the end uh, on this second aspect of Ruski Mir. It is based on the concept of the West as weak, corrupted, disunited, that should be even further corrupted with this vision of uh, presumed partnership with Russia, which is always connected with humiliation. That's the way how, how Putin, for example, presents his meetings with President Macron, in order to humiliate his patron. That's why he creates this distance, then leaks uh, exactly some elements of this talk in order to say, it is you that want to talk with me on my conditions, not on yours. And uh, that's how he wants first to divide Western Europe from Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe is concerned, of course, with the scenario of the next war of the next dismemberment of Ukraine after this one would be accepted somehow by uh, Western partners. And after dividing Eastern Europe from Western Europe, the next goal or parallel goal is to divide fully Western Europe from uh, the US. This is very simple. This is uh, nothing mysterious in that. And uh, this war helps Putin, at least I believe, he, uh, he is sure that it will help him to make these two breaches even deeper. At this particular moment when we meet, it seems that his strategy fails because the West is united as it had never been for the last at least three decades. But what will happen after several months of, uh, I would say, fatigue and uh, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, disenchantment uh, uh, of that uh, original enthusiasm towards Ukraine. Our uh, gas prices are going high, Ukraines cannot win, so maybe, maybe, why should we bother with Ukraine? Our prices are more important, we are responsible before our uh, constituency, uh, which is French, German, Italian, or whatever else, uh, or American, so maybe we should talk, if not with Putin, maybe with someone else, but somehow we, we have to make a deal. And this is exactly what would separate Eastern Europe from Western Europe. And then there is always this temptation, Western Europe should be independent from America, should regain its, uh, its full independence, and only Russia can help uh, uh, Western Europe to do this. 
So this is the concept of Ruski Mir as Pax Rossica. Uh, to use the last phrase, I would say that insecurity as a method of racket, as a method of extortion, further and further conquest by Russia. This is uh, the simplest, uh, maybe too simple, understanding of what is going on uh, now in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful contribution to the debate. And now I would uh, give uh, the floor to Daniel Fried and to ask him a very simple question. In France and in many other countries, there is, uh, there is a recurrent question uh, why the West wanted to uh, ens encircle uh, Russia why NATO was accepting new members, why NATO was ready to accept Ukraine, and so on. Of course, it is uh, not true, uh, but uh, I would like to, to, to ask uh, Daniel Fried specifically to answer this issue and to explain the NATO position towards, uh, towards uh, the enlargement and the Ukraine. Does the West have something to reproach to itself? No. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm really not into self-flagellation by democracies. That really doesn't interest me. Now, full disclosure, I was one of the architects during the Clinton and Bush administrations of NATO enlargement and in parallel an attempt to build a good NATO relationship with Russia, with Yeltsin and Russia. So, you know, full disclosure, right? I, I was part of that debate. But honestly, can we just stop pretending that, that Putin's war against Ukraine is about NATO enlargement? Don't take my word for it. Listen to Vladimir Putin, for God's sakes. He has told us what it's about. Oh. Sure, it's about Ukrainian fascists, so-called, which, as Andrzej Novak pointed out, is any Ukrainian who doesn't accept the fact that he's really a Russian. If you don't accept that you're a Russian, you're a fascist. That's one reason. Another reason is uh, also given by Putin himself, this is about Russia's recapturing lands that rightfully belong to it. Putin gave a big speech on the 350th anniversary of Peter the Great's birth. And you can do Peter the Great a lot of ways. Westernizer, reformer, authoritarian modernizer. But no, no, Putin doesn't take any of those ways. What he talks about is Peter the Great, empire builder. He took land from the Swedes. That wasn't Swedish land at all. It was our land. It was always our land. This is not about NATO enlargement. NATO enlargement, the purpose of NATO enlargement was to help create a united Europe, a united Europe after the end of the Cold War. Those of us who were thinking about NATO enlargement actually, and you may laugh, referred to the Atlantic Charter of Roosevelt and Churchill and compared it favorably to Yalta and said, we want to end Yalta Europe. We want to go back to the Atlantic Charter. And that means the security underpinnings of an enlarged EU. It wasn't NATO versus the EU. It was NATO enlargement to provide the conditions for EU enlargement by erasing the mental line in everybody's head that somehow the line of Yalta, the line of the Cold War, had to be the, a permanent line in Europe which is way, the way most of, most of the West started out in 1989. Poland may be free, but it really isn't part of us. And if, if that sounds weird, trust me, that's where most of the US foreign policy and European foreign policy establishments were. It took a lot of effort to erase that line, and the argument for NATO enlargement is, for God's sakes, 
He didn't fight World War II to liberate part of Europe up to the line that Stalin drew in 1945 when his armies ended. That's not, that was not our purpose. We had to accept the conditions of reality, of the limits of our power in 1945, but we didn't have to love it. And then we had an opportunity to go back to our original aims of Europe whole and free. We took it. But we didn't take it to isolate or humiliate Russia. We built in parallel a system of reaching out to NATO, and we called it, you know, our, our internal term was the alliance with the alliance. In other words, if Yeltsin had been as successful as we hoped he would be in the early 90s, then that NATO-Russia rel relationship could have been saved. It could have been real. Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. We did not want to isolate Russia, but we did not want to buy Russia's cooperation by giving them the 100 million Europeans between the Baltic and the Black Sea as a consolation prize for losing their empire. I mean, really? Are the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Bulgarians not Europeans? And if not, what are they? Property of Russia to be reclaimed when Russia is strong enough? I mean, what are the implications of not enlarging NATO? The implications of not enlarging NATO is we accept a Russian sphere of domination. Now, there are those who make that argument even today. Ukraine properly belongs to Russia, so give it up. And by the way, it's all hopeless anyway. Oh, the argument, the argument, in fact, some of the same people who argued against NATO enlargement in the 90s are arguing that Ukraine properly belongs to Russia today. And they argue either that we must not humiliate Putin, in other words, the Ukrainians can't win even though they may, or that the Ukrainians can never win, it's impossible, in either case, Ukrainians in danger of winning, Ukrainians cannot win. The policy solution is always the same, give it to Moscow. As if the Ukrainians have no agency or identity. It doesn't matter what we think. In 2013, Putin had exactly what he wanted, a pro-Ukrainian le leader on the throne no Ukrainian desire to join NATO. The EU, the, the limit of the EU amb ambition for Ukraine was a modest association agreement, and the US was fine with that. We didn't love it, but we didn't fight it. It was, it was reality. Putin blew it up by forcing Yanukovych to rescind his promise to sign the association agreement. That led to the Maidan. He then took Russian advice and tried to shoot people at the Maidan. That led to his overthrow. That led to Putin's first invasion of Crimea, which, yes, Garry Kasparov is dead on right. He foretold it. Oh, by the way, I have to add one thing you missed. At the 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest where Putin made a speech, he claimed Crimea as Russian territory. And I was sitting next to the then Polish uh, <coughs> national security advisor, Mariusz Hanslik, and we both stood up involuntarily and said, did you hear that? Did you hear that? He claimed Ukraine because he said when it was transferred from the Russian to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, not all proper legal procedures were followed. And I thought, oh God, <laughs> this, is, this isn't good. But we were not, and you're right about that, Gary, we weren't in the Bush administration ready to accept that. My bosses didn't want to hear it until after the Russo-Georgian War, and then it was too late. And then Obama came in and did the reset. But for all the American mistakes, and as, a, you know, as an American former government official, yeah, whatever your list is, I assure you mine is longer, we never betrayed our core vision of a united Europe, held by all presidents from Ronald Reagan, with the, with the exception of Donald Trump. 
but certainly adhered to by the current President Joe Biden. We never betrayed that vision for all our errors of tactics and mistakes of judgment, like thinking the Russians would win the war in the first 72 hours. We never betrayed that vision. We made honest mistakes, and we recovered from them. So what do we do about that now? Stop feeling guilty. You know, let's just stop. Recognize the Russian threat for what it is, and there's no me need <laughs> to add to what Garrett Kasparov and Andrzej Novak said. They described it plus the historical roots better than I could. I don't know how the war will turn out. Nobody does. Ukrainian victory is not guaranteed. Neither is Ukrainian defeat. There is an area of unknown. Ukraine may not have the power to regain the Crimea or every inch of the Donbass, but it could turn back the Russian attack. It could regain a lot of territory. The Russians could have trouble holding what they've, achieved, what they've grabbed. Or the Russians could continue to advance slowly and painfully. We don't know, nobody knows. And in fact, we have the ability, the collective West, to influence, not determine, but influence the outcome. And therefore, we have responsibility commensurate with that possibility. We have two principal levers. Military assistance now underway. There is a major military logistics operation that the United States is leading with Great Britain and Poland operating largely, though not exclusively, through Polish territory. It is an operation like the operation to provide weapons to Great Britain and arm the French resistance. You know, the an analogy isn't perfect because it's a conventional real live war in Ukraine. We need to do more and faster. All right, I, I'm not here and with, with Secretary Mattis in the audience, I'm not going to start talking about HIMARS or what more we could provide, but we need to do more. Secondly, sanctions. The sanctions in 2014 were better than nothing, but the ones now are a lot better than those. But they're not enough. Right now, the G7 is debating a, imposing a price cap on, on Russia's sale of oil, which is its principal export item. There are a lot of people, including some in this audience, who don't think that's practical. I don't know. But I do know that the Biden administration and G7 are taking it seriously, and they better take it seriously, because if you're trying to stop Putin, you have to go after the money. And you may have to accept a degree of risk. Nobody's tried anything like a price cap on oil. It has risks. But then again, I keep hearing the Ukrainians say, what the hell are you talking about? You, what risks are you taking compared to the ones we take every day? Our risk tolerance should rise with the emergency. There are other things we can do. We need to put the pressure on Russia now while political support in Europe and the United States remains high. We don't need to agonize about various negotiating scenarios, which always end up with some comfortable people in the West drawing lines on a map and disposing of other people. You know, and when we do that, let's just say that other people's citizens end up in boxcars traveling in the wrong direction, usually east. Enough. Right now, our duty is clear. Help the Ukrainians push the Russians. When it comes time to negotiate, <coughs> let Ukraine make that call for and make it from a position of the greatest possible strength we can provide. And don't agonize too much about it. Not now. And let's not forget, finally, last thought, Look, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War and the general conviction within the United States and Western Europe that we were losing. That communism was bad, but boy, those commies are really clever. They will outwit us. Which was the general view held up until the mid-1980s. 
Nobody predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. Nobody predicted 1989. And in Poland, the first country to take down communism, it was really sort of only Lech Wałęsa who was absolutely confident of victory. Even his own team wasn't. But they won, now didn't they? And we all did. We helped Poland. When communism fell there, it fell across Eastern Europe. The Berlin Wall came down. The Soviet Union was destroyed. Now the empire is trying to come back. But let's not forget that democracies are not doomed. We are more resilient than our enemies think. We have more possibilities than we ourselves realize. And I'll end by quoting Abraham Lincoln. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really a very useful reminder that the right cause should win. Um, I, I would ask another question to, uh, to Gary Kasparov, and then we shall uh, take questions from the present people. Um, we didn't talk about one thing uh, today. Uh, what is the state of Russian public opinion. Uh, we all know that it was submitted to more than 20 years of a very awful propaganda. Uh, by the way, um, for years, many people uh, and myself were claim claiming that one should read Russian newspapers, Russian sites, watch Russian television in order to understand what's going on and what, is what are they preparing. Because, you know, uh, Kremlin uh, w was often neutral, saying, no, no, it is not true, it's and so on. But Russian propagandists were talking in advance about things which were going to happen later. And all this war was fully predicted, one may say, by Russian television for years already. So my question is, uh, what is the state of Russian public opinion today? Can we hope that sooner or later this, uh, uh, this strong support uh, of Putin would weaken? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just a very few couple of quick remarks following uh, uh, Andrew and Daniel um, uh, comments is this. It's uh, recently Russia reiterated calls for Poland to, to take e Western Ukraine. They're just, it, it's a propaganda repeating it, even for Russian foreign minister. Again, it's just, these ideas do not die. So they, and also the same claims for Hungary. So that's encouraging Orban to look for, for 150,000 Hungarians or whatever the number is living uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the corner of, of um, Western, Western Ukraine. Yeah, and also there's one little you know, thing that says when we talk about the roots for the war, so you, you, you Daniel pointed out 2008, Putin's claim. I think in 2008 or 2007, there was a something that nobody paid attention to, but it was, it's very important statistically in Russian. It, you say, v Ukraine or no Ukraine, in or on. V means country, na means not country. So they changed this, 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 this word in official documents back then, shifted from in to on. Again, just tiny thing. But you can say that from that moment, Putin, Putin, Putin officially you know, uh, declared Ukraine non-state. So it's the, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and speaking about the reasons is this, you know, or just you know, how they prepared for the war. You know, when you prepare for the war, what do you do with your budget? So what you cut social security, healthcare, education, you add military security apparatus, propaganda, you look at Russian budget. And what, what commodity do you buy in great numbers? Gold. gold. So you simply look at the numbers. You know, for, for 10 years, it was a war budget. Putin was very consistent in investing you know, heavily in, in all elements uh, of the war machine, from propaganda to, 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 to his missiles and tanks, and s steadily cut expenses on, 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 on what he thought was absolutely un un unnecessary. Now, 
thinking about Russian public, uh, I think it's the, we could be as objective as identifying the Mahmoud in Russia as we could be objective in Nazi Germany in 1940. The answer is, I don't know. It's on the surface, like the, today they said Putin's support is 79%. Do I trust these numbers? No. Do I know whether it's how f close it's to reality? I don't know. We can say that the significant portion of Russian population, whether it's a majority or not, supports Putin and the war. For a simple reason, they don't know better. And let's not forget, you know, it's the most of Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine, they were even born when Putin w became president, so this is, he's in power for 22 years, or they went to school, yes, when he was. So they don't know anything else, it's Putin. So even in 1944, 1945, you know, the many Germans still, you know, believed in Fuhrer, and he was in power for less than 12 years. Putin's in power for more than 20 years. So I think it had, S tremendous negative impact on the minds of so many Russians. Also, as, as Andrew pointed out, Putin avoids dragging Moscow and, and St. Petersburg or other big cities like Yekaterinburg into the war. You have s all this s almost no impact, no body bags. Yes, the, the price is going up, you know, the economy is not working, so this, but again, this is not the same as, as, as receiving body bags. So he's, he uh, drags recruits from either from national republics like Chechnya, Dagestan, uh, Buryatia, Tuva, I think uh, Buryatia and Tuva have the highest uh, uh, percentage of, of, of uh, casualties in, 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 in Ukraine, or from very poor, desolated uh, uh, Russian countryside, and, and offers a lot of money. So 12 million rubles for, for, for dead men in, 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 in the places where the average pension is 15,000 rubles. So it's it's it could it's very it's very attractive and three million for 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 for, for wounded. So it's whether they pay it or not that's another story. But that's that's what they are they they using this this uh, this argument. And uh, Russian television dominates the space. So the all opposition outlets being destroyed completely. So um, but at the same time we had the biggest exodus of Russian intellectuals since 1917. Never happened, you know, after February 24th. So we have a massive, massive exodus. So it's when you start looking at the top Russian writers, painters, you know, the culture, it's their, their other side. So this is, and again, Putin doesn't need intellect. It's, it's, it's all about war. And um, as long as he can keep this, the, the illusion that he is winning, he, I think, can control the situation. I think this is something to, to remember. I think it's very much psychology of the, of, of the Russians. They can bear sacrifices if they believe they're winning, but they will never forgive the government for losing. So that's, that's the key. Every loss of the war, whether it's Crimean War in the middle of 19th century, whether it's a, a Russo-Japanese War, whether it's the, the um, World War I, the moment they thought that the government was you know, just losing, it, it led to dramatic political changes. So that's why it's important for Putin to keep this, this, this picture. And you know, what can change it? The news from the front line. I still, it's this for those who think, oh, what are the chances of coup d'etat, a palace coup in Russia? None. It's this only when Putin is weak. Dictator is never attacked by his cronies if he looks strong. The only n public attempt on Hitler's life was July 20th, 1944, when the, all the generals already knew the war was lost because of Normandy landing was successful. And still, majority of the armies st stayed, st stayed with the Fuhrer. So only the news from, from frontline, from Donbass, or attack, successful attack on, on, Sevastopol, on Sevastopol, like you know, attacking the fleet, or attack on Crimean Bridge, something that will show to Russia's wait that war is going in the wrong, wrong direction. And combination of these factors plus sanctions, then they'll start thinking, putting things together, one, one on one. Sanctions, war is, war is, it's not lost, but we are on the wrong side now, maybe we're losing. So then we can expect we can expect uh, changes. Uh, otherwise, we will rely on, on, on uh, unspec un um, confirmed data. So whether it comes from Putin or from some quasi-independent polling stations, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, take them seriously. We d think that there is a considerable number of Russians who are opposing the war because during the first two weeks, there were something like 16,000 arrests made in Russia, so a few hundred thousand people protested. Which means that you know that probably a few million definitely oppose it because you have to be very brave to show up on the street when you know you end up in jail for three years for simply saying no, no, no to war. But I would still say that the majority is either for Putin or sitting on the fence. 
just again this not ready to 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 take any action thank you very much for for this and now we shall take some questions from the public i saw some hands Thank you very much. My name is Alessia Frumachuk. I'm a historian and director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, I'd like to draw our attention to the use of terminology that we, um, that we use in these discussions, implying that the early stages of this war was somehow a civil war because the, the people spoke um, the same language is, is a sign of profoundly understanding the situation in Ukraine. Um, there's a reason why Ukrainians speak Russian. Um, even Ukrainians like myself who come from Western Ukraine still speak Russian and the reason is that's what empires do to you. And implying that um, languages somehow can be equated with political affiliation or national affiliation uh, is not going to go down well in many countries, in Scotland, in Ireland, in Francophone Canada, not to mention uh, Ukraine for that matter. And it would be enough to speak to volunteer battalions in the early stages of uh, the war in Donbass to know what language they spoke and in what language they would like to tell the Russian warship where to go. Um, so it, I just this is just a remark really to pay attention to the way we speak about this war. So war, not conflict. Uh, Russian proxies, not rebels. Um, Russian aggression, not civil war. Illegal occupation, not annexation. Because if we don't, we, we support the very Ruski Mir, the Russian world, that uh, Putin propagates and that uh, Professor Novak was talking about earlier. And the more we trust Ukrainians with their own self-identification and assessment of the situation, the fewer mistakes of this kind we're going to make. Um, but very quick question. So we talk about peace quite a lot. There was a discussion of potential peace and negotiations at dinner last night as well, and I'm sure there will be more now, but I'd like to ask you how you see justice. Because without justice, there will be no lasting peace. To answer this, <laughs> <laughs> huh? all of you. Okay, all of you. Uh, okay. Uh, so the question about justice uh, is countered usually with the uh, objection that reality doesn't accept full justice, that it is impossible. Nevertheless, uh, my answer to that objection is that without justice there would be only a prolongment of bigger and more cruel injustice. It has to be stopped, as I fully agree with what Mr. Kasparov said, that only at the moment Putin loses the war. It is not, uh, so to speak, uh, co-equal with the vision of Ukrainians in the Moscow Kremlin. No, this simply means that the West should help Ukraine to defend a general principle against territorial expansion. That's a very general uh, principle. It doesn't apply only to Ukraine, but to any country that could be endangered with such a method as Putin uses against Ukraine. So this is the first thing. Putin must be stopped. At the moment he would be stopped, he could be, uh, so to speak, uh, met with an open rebellion within his own country. And this is my only hope for the change in Russia. And only in such a scenario, there would be a room for justice, for justice from criminal, for criminals in Russia. Because justice only from outside, without Russians participating in uh, in that justice against these criminals would be, uh, I would say, unrealistic. And this is my only agreement with the concept of realism in that respect. Is it possible that Ukraine might find it in its interests to accept an unjust ceasefire to save Ukrainian lives. That's not a call for any American or any European to make. It's a call only for Ukrainians. <laughs> You're right about justice. You're also right, 
and it was your implication, and it was Andre's point explicitly, that Putin will not stop. If there were a ceasefire, does anybody still think that he would be satisfied with that? Or would you look at a ceasefire as a piedigishka, a pause, to remobilize and continue his conquest, his, his, the achievement of his aims, which is the conquest and neutralization under Russian control of all of Ukraine? So let's be realistic and not fool ourselves. Deception is sometimes a necessary diplomatic practice, but self-deception is never a good idea. <laughs> but you notice how I'm answering your question. The Biden administration has wisely chosen as its safe space the position that it is not for the United States in public or in private to put pressure on Ukraine to settle. Or in private. That's important. They know that there is no nothing good to, to come out of the United States leaning on Kyiv to do a bad deal without justice. It is possible that Ukraine, if given sufficient Western economic support, economic pressure on Russia, and most of all, military support, weapons, can stop the Russians and set into motion this cycle. That, that we were talking about. If not, the Ukrainians will have to make that decision, but the Ukrainians, <laughs> you don't need me to tell you, there is no way the Ukrainians will believe that a ceasefire will mean an end to Putin's ambition, and we shouldn't fool ourselves either. We shouldn't fool ourselves either. We were too eager after 2014 and 2015 to accept that the conflict was contained and that the Minsk process could go on forever and we were wrong and everybody, especially the Ukrainians, are paying the price for that mistake. If it comes to a ceasefire without justice, which is not what you're advocating and you hate the idea, but if it comes to that, then we will have a task of strengthening Ukraine and continuing to weaken Russia in anticipation of Putin trying to take the next move. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And we shouldn't be in a goddamned hurry to start coming up with diplomatic plans which always involve somebody else's concessions. We don't need to do that. Anybody in the United, anybody in the Biden administration who writes up a kind of a peace plan is doing a, 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 a political suicide note. And they shouldn't do it. And there's no need to do it. Concentrate on what we, on, on what we have to do right now. And then we'll figure out, hopefully we get peace with justice. And if not, that, that we'll deal with that. Anyway, that's a long answer, but that's a serious question. And that's the best shot, I, I, and, and I gave my best shot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more, sir, with what has been said about, about Putin's ambitions. There's no ceasefire, even no, uh, how do you call it, negotiated outcome will, will solve the problem. So that's why I think it's, this in, it's staying in the realm of what is doable. So I think that there is one important statement yet, you know, uh, uh, to be made by the leaders of the free world is to uh, make it absolutely clear for Russians, for the rest of the world, that sanctions will stay until three conditions are met. Ukraine is liberated, fully liberated. Into back to the borders of 1991, internationally recognized border. Two, reparations fully paid to rebuild Ukraine according to the estimates of the international community. Three, war criminals brought to justice. 
that's what, in my view, is, is a must. So, yes, nobody wants to start, you know, a conflict with Russia here in, in NATO, just, you know, risking a nuclear Armageddon. But sanctions are in place. And sanctions, um, they could have also a very important psychological impact if they know that these sanctions are tied to certain conditions. And I think those three conditions, and the last of them, not least, is just, you know, bringing war criminals to justice. So I think that's, that's, this is the way to send message back to Russia, that there will be no future with Putin or Putin's regime. It's not enough, you know, to, to pray for Putin to die and somebody else to take over. It's basically to bring, you know, bring the whole regime responsible for this war, because Putin wouldn't be able to start a war on his own. So it's the, so, and, and the whole machine, whether it's military machines, security apparatus, or propaganda, down. And that's the, that's the way to go. Sanctions will do it. It's, I know many people have doubts about sanctions. They say, oh, sanctions are not working. Just four and a half months, and they're already having tremendous impact on the Russian economy. Give it another four months, and the country probably may just, you know, may start falling in pieces. And that's important for everyone in Russia to know. Sanctions will not be lifted until, I already said it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are many hands. Whom do we? Okay, let's start from you. Do you have a microphone? No, but I think that. Ah, okay. <laughs> Consulates in Russia were to open 24 hours a day, seven days a week with no holidays and give out visas to anyone who is a medical person, a doctor, a nurse, or a software engineer, or an engineer essential for the oil and gas industry or for atomic power in Russia, and let them live permanently and work permanently in Europe or the United States. The brain drain would be massive, and those people are impossible for Putin to replace. And Putin has no clear retaliation mechanism, because I don't think there are too many engineers in the West looking to move east. <laughs> Why have we not started thinking about immigration as a weapon? That is my question. Thank you very much. Uh, indi indeed, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who left Russia during the last month, starting from March, and this flow continues. It is true that they are not much uh, helped in the West. Uh, they go to Armenia, to Georgia, to Estonia, and so on, uh, whenever they can, uh, they can go. But of course, there is not enough work in these countries for these people. So it could be a bright idea. Now, uh, if I may say a few words, it is uh, also a possibility, there is also a possibility that Putin's regime just closes the country like it was in the Soviet Union when the exit visas were uh, uh, needed. Uh, Putin takes, Putin's regime takes it very badly that some people are leaving, especially when it, uh, th they are known intellectuals or artists <coughs> uh, and so on. Uh, so. I personally believe that the idea is good, but we might also know that any time country might be closed. Do you agree, Gary? Mm, I'm not so sure. So I think there are limits for Putin's ability to build another Iron Curtain. Soviet Union, um, uh, with all its uh, 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 ills, uh, had economy that had very little dependence on the free world. And also there was so-called, you know, socialist bloc. So it has been functioning. Russian economy, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, uh, um, kept, you know, just building new and new ties with, with the free world. And uh, now even Putin's beloved oil and gas industry heavily depends on, on, on uh, 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 Western spare parts, Western uh, tur turbines and, 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 this, you know, and pumps. So um, closing the country completely is it possible? Yes. But that's, you know, then following this question, that will make his situation worse because that immediately affects Moscow and St. Petersburg. So that's, it's, this is, even if these people are not ready to leave, they believe they can. So the moment he start hurting, you know, people in big cities, even indirectly, so it could lead to, to uh, 
the end of the social apathy. So that's why, again, I would be, I would be happy to, to, to follow this suggestion. But before it's being done, it's very important for Europe and America, especially for Europe, actually, to recognize that there are so many Russians who left, you know, uh, and, and they are now struggling, you know, just, just because of your Russian passport. So you have, you're struggling to, to open a bank account or get a visa. And we are, you know, just the Russian Action Committee, we support it. We are asking friendly European governments, you know, to do a simple test. Yes, every Russian who is applying for documents should sign a declaration that has, again, three points. One is the war is criminal. Two, regime is Putin regime is illegitimate. Three, Ukraine is a whole. As long as you sign this declaration, put your name there, you can apply. It doesn't mean that you will be fully served, but you can, you can apply. So this, those are the things that I think are important to offer um, an incentive to Russians to separate from the cannibal regime. So this is just give them a chance. And then we'll see what happens. I think that's the, if the idea is fully implemented, you have very long lines, you know, longer than to McDonald's in 1989 in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So next question, please. There is somebody there. And I, I, I thought uh, there was somebody here as well. Okay, next one. Hi, my, <coughs> my name is Christopher Tremolia with the Intercollegiate Studies Institute today. Um, I had a two-part question. Um, we're talking about Putin and getting Putin out of power. Um, has there ever been a thought for or consideration to possibly use soft power and influence the Russian people to remove Putin? Um, in the Russian Constitution, uh, chapters 4, Article 8, and I believe Articles 92 and 93 deal with impeachment of the Russian president. Could that possibly be a realistic option to remove uh, Putin from office by using soft power um, to persuade the Russian people and officials necessary. My second question, uh, second part of the question is having to do with NATO. Um, it has been, uh, Mr. Freed said today that NATO, you were saying, uh, does not, the whole theory about NATO being responsible for Putin's actions. Um, I agree somewhat, but I somewhat disagree. Um, IR theory through the past 30, 40 years um, is predicated on NATO expansion antagonizing Russian aggression. Um, George Kennan, the architect of the Cold War, um, he wrote an op-ed in 1997 uh, to the New York Times, The Faithful Error, which said such as that. And um, Biden's current CIA, uh, Biden's CIA director, William Burns, um, also wrote memos in 1995 and 2008 also saying that. So I understand your perspective, but what would your be your answer to um, those two options? Would you answer? Both. I'll answer both. First, George Kennan said a lot of things in his long life. He didn't like NATO's existence at all. He didn't think much of Poland. He didn't think, I don't think he was ever inside a Soviet apartment. He didn't know any dissidents. He didn't care about it very much. He had a very abstract notion of international relations and IR theory. Okay, I won't go there. But are you, those that said that NATO enlargement would antagonize Russia and their alternative is what? Go to Lech Wałęsa and Václav Havel in 1993 and say, we're glad you overthrew communism in your own countries by virtue of which we won the Cold War and for you, we promise to shed tears when Moscow reoccupies your country. Yet, you try it. In fact, Bill Clinton did try it. He did try to sell Wałęsa and Václav Havel on the Partnership for Peace as an alternative to NATO membership and they gave him a look. I mean, this was in January 1994 in Prague. They basically said in their own rather different styles, uh, we, do you think we're stupid? Do you think we struggled for democracy for years and years and overthrew communism to take some leavings and shavings that you provide us? Like, no. We did it. We overthrew communism for ourselves and for you, fool. So you're going to build a new cold, a new post-Cold War world by perpetuating the line of the Cold War? No, I don't have any sympathy the opponents of NATO enlargement, I remember those arguments vividly, fought against them. 
And when I started out, there were only like three or four of us. But as the consequences of perpetuating the line of the Cold War by not enlarging NATO became clear, the Clinton administration changed. And as, and I'll give a happier answer to your question about soft power. I don't think it should be used explicitly to try to overthrow Putin, but it is being used, it is being used to reach out to the Russian people. In the 1980s, some, we supported Sami's Dad in Eastern Europe especially, and then it was all about like smuggling in parts for mimeograph machines into Poland, right? Through Sweden, through the Brussels, the Solidarity Brussels office, great stuff, right? Mimeograph machines. Right now, it's all about helping Russian activists evade Kremlin censorship with new online tools that I really don't understand and it doesn't matter. And that sort of stuff is going on a lot. And it's, you know, the, there's a lot of money in this. It is the equivalent of supporting the dissidents of the 1970s and 80s in a digital world. So yes, that's going on. Yes, it should be, and yes, we should increase the budget, but I'm happy to say that Congress has really increased the budget for this kind of activity. And the Russians hate it, and they target you know, the people that are doing it, but there's a lot of it going on, and so far it is successful. Putin has not shut it down. All right, so yeah, and good. Thank uh, you. Is there, I, uh, what was the name of the institute? Uh, are you studying time machines or politics? <laughs> I'm curious because the last time, if I remember correctly, Russian parliament, we still had a parliament 25 years ago, tried to impeach president was in 97, 98. It failed. Ever since, probably have noticed, Russia turned into a fascist dictatorship. So your question is as relevant as asking whether German Reichstag could Im impeach Hitler in 1940 or Supreme Soviet of, uh, uh, su su what was the name of Soviet Union, so could uh, imp uh, uh, impeach Stalin back then. Um, I stopped my professional chess career and, and formed one of the most uh, uh, resilient anti-Putin organizations back in 2005. And we had many, many attempts of that type. We marched on our streets peacefully. We didn't have a single act of violence. Not a single broken window. Okay, it's not like demonstrations in France today. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the only violence came from, from uh, 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 riot police or Putin security apparatus. So people who march peacefully with me on the streets, they are in exile like myself, in jail like Alexei Navalny, or killed like Boris Nemtsov. Don't tell us we didn't try. We tried. We failed. I understand. We're all, you know, responsible for not maybe trying hard. But telling now when just, you know, so many people either in jail or in exile or killed, so that, oh, what are the ways of, of, of depose Putin? There are none. It's a single, um, um, it's, it's a unified fascist dictatorship under former KGB, KGB boss. So, and um, um, as I said, the only conditions for Russian people to rise is to combine economic sanctions with eco uh, Ukraine decisive military victory. Uh, and as for, um, it was not a question directed to me, and Daniel already answered this question. I think, you know, just uh, looking at my friend Gabriel, the foreign minister of Lithuania, I think stop asking this insulting question, because we all know the answer. If not for NATO, Russian tanks will be rolling on the streets of Tallinn, Vilnius, and Riga as we speak now. <laughs> this, you know, when I hear these questions from people who, who paid no price for their freedom, for Americans or Europeans who take it for granted. How on earth you can criticize Ukrainians who are paying the highest price ever to join Europe or the Baltic nations that paid such a huge price to become part of the free world? I think it's, it's pers personally, I, I think it's, 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 it's uh, shameful. And please stop asking these questions while I'm in presence. Thank you. Um, there are two questions here, I think. Um, what, uh, when should we stop, tell me? Ten minutes? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm a university student visiting here from Paris and I come from a Russian-Ukrainian family, so a lot of what has been mentioned here definitely hits personally and I've heard a lot of rhetoric and propaganda and views that have been 
uh, said today. Um, I have a question regarding what the future of Russia can mean for the world, for the future of, the wor of Europe and the world. Um, I think people worldwide, I mean me in particular, uh, may have both faith but also concern um, about the younger generations of Russian youth as there are reports and stories of so-called like uh, patriotic education happening currently um, in Russia with textbooks being changed, rewritten, Ukrainian history being ignored, um, Soviet history being written as well. And this was seen historically too through Soviet propaganda during the Soviet regime. Um, and I'm wondering, I know there's not one answer to this, um, if even any, um, but I'm wondering what are any opinions or ideas about what can be done um, especially that this type of propaganda to the youth can go beyond Putin and his government, but is also instilled through teachers, parents, families, friends to the Russian youth. Um, and as mentioned during the panel, Russian state propaganda does have a deep hold on the population, and many people may be scared to speak up or seek change. So that leaves few possibilities. So what can be done? Thank you. Maybe just uh, uh, one uh, answer that was already given to, to this kind of um, objections to the future of Russia. The moment when Putin loses, the moment when the regime loses, not the Putin himself only, uh, could be, we hope, but this is, I believe, also a, real, a realistic assessment that uh, general mood also as regards younger generation can change because the regime would stop to deliver victories and the victories over neighbors, the victories trampling freedom, showing weakness of freedom, are the most persuasive tool of Putin's popularity. So the moment he cannot deliver yet another victory of that kind uh, could be uh, a really uh, a breaking point of, of that uh, popular opinion that that backs him in Russia. Of course, the process of uh, regaining a kind of alternative Russian identity built rather on Novgorod and Pskov traditions than the Moscow one is <laughs> very long, very difficult. But we can start from that point. And I think uh, another uh, scenario, which is completely unrealistic, is the scenario of 1945. That is the moment when uh, Russia would be forced by other victorious powers uh, to change internally as Germany and Japan were forced after World War II. So taking this particular scenario as unrealistic, I stick to the first one. We should stop Russian imperialism at the borders of Ukraine and really uh, fighting victoriously the war for liberty, which would somehow persuade younger generation that liberty is not obsolete. It's maybe old uh, virtue, but not obsolete. Thank you. Thank you. There is one no, question well, I, here. Yeah, can I just you know, add, because uh. it's the, as for you know, Russian future, you know, um, Putin regime is a cancer. And you don't negotiate with cancer. You don't compromise with cancer. You cut it out. And the only way to cut it out is a decisive Ukrainian military victory. The best way to clean the minds of Russians who are now living under the spell, it's Ukrainian flag raised in Sevastopol. That will be the end of Putin's regime because every dictatorship is, survives with a myth. Crimea is a key element of this mythology. The liberation of Crimea and, 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 and the decisive military defeat of Putin's armada. So we'll tell Russians that it failed. We have to convince them that the imperial model is dead. And then they'll look elsewhere. So I believe that the Russia has only two options for the future, to become a Chinese satellite or to reconstitute itself without any um, references to the, its imperial past, not only Soviet past. So as I said, you know, scientifically, we have to extract an imperial matrix out of the code of Russian statehood. Is it doable? I don't know. But that's the only way to move forward. And if some parts of Russia would like to go, like Chechnya or Dagestan or Tatarstan, so be it. It's very important just to, to have a fresh start. Maybe it's not doable, but the first condition is, you know, Ukrainian victory. So that's why, again, I, I think it's nothing else but making sure that Ukraine has all opportunities, material resources, or else 
or else to win this war. Uh, there is one question here, and probably it would be the last one, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, can you hear me? Okay. This is mainly a question to Dan, but I would also like Andre and Gary to comment. Um, I completely agree with you that we shouldn't be in, as you put it, damn hurry to get to a settlement. But the fact remains that in a number of European capitals, some pretty major ones, a number of political leaders seem to be in a damn hurry to get to a settlement. So the question is, is, is it just a lack of courage? Worse still, a lack of political imagination to envision what Europe and Russia by extension could look like? Or is there a third explanation that I'm not seeing here? Uh, how do you account for that, that we seem to be on the one hand saying we should not push the Ukrainians, but if you look at the narratives and the conversations and actions of a number of leaders, they seem to be, at least some of them, eager to get in a damn hurry to a settlement. Well, <coughs> it, it was addressed to me, so I'll give it a try. There is an undercurrent of opinion that a Ukrainian victory, however you define it, is just too hard. And that, uh, that view is bolstered by fear of the economic consequences of Putin's pressure on Europe and the cut of natural gas. That American and West European publics distracted by higher inflation and the political opposition this will generate are going to rush to try to end the war, the party of peace versus the party of justice. Okay, with all the dangers that we were discussing earlier. And we can't dismiss that or wish it away, that's real. But it, when I was in government, my job was not to get angry at difficult reality, but figure out how to how to get around it. Well, what do you do with that set of circumstances and what you do is recognize that right now we have the political basis to do what we need to do. More weapons to Ukraine, more economic pressure on Putin. You know, so I'm not gonna worry myself too much about what happens if Western political support falls apart. What I'm gonna do is the maximum now to extend that political support and use the time we have to help Ukraine. So if the circumstances are such that the pressure is enormous on Ukraine or they wanna make a settlement, that they do so from the best possible position. And that means not being in too much of a damned hurry to draw lines on a map, but it's perfectly reasonable to start thinking about other elements of what a ceasefire could look like, like in particular, what do security guarantees for Ukraine look like? What's, how are we gonna help Ukraine post ceasefire, assuming that Putin's ambitions remain the same, which I think they will, how do we help them resist and defeat the next Putin attack? What do we do about sanctions? I mean, we can't take them off while Putin maintains his claim to all of Ukraine, nor should we, nor should we agonize about it very much, but then Putin's gonna come back and say, okay, you don't take off sanctions, we keep the grain locked up. Well, you know, we can think about ways around that. In other words, there are things we can do right now to, to do better than agonize about the situation if Western opinion will no longer, no longer stay strong. Like when I was in government, it's like, d don't come to me. Don't start coming to me w about what Putin's gonna do. Start, go back to your offices and start thinking about what we're gonna do to him. That's how Ulysses S. Grant won the Civil War. That's how we can beat Putin. And yeah, I went all, you know, I referenced an actual war. But there's a real war going on right now, so let's think in those terms. Let's get it. Just a quick commentary to this opposition between war party and justice party. 
the second party is the party of the world's war because uh, there is war party against appeasement party and appeasement always lead to world's war, war in a very quick, uh, so to speak, uh, verdict of history. Uh, one uh, needs not to be reminded uh, with the results of the peaceful generation as Neville Chamberlain uh, called uh, the peace uh, taken from Munich conference. So we are talking between war party, uh, opposition between war party that wants victory of Ukraine stopping effectively Putin's regime from further expansion and appeasement party, which leads to much worse war in the very near future. Thank you. Yeah, often parallels being made with the 30s, and of course, names Chamberlain Daladi always came to mind. I think, you know, we have to be more grateful to them. They were naive. They made horrible mistake that led to the World War II. But they were not there to make a deal with Hitler to continue business with Germany. So there's a difference. And they didn't know what was coming next. They didn't have a history books to learn from. Uh, and also, they, they both recognized the criminal nature of, of Hitler regime. And Chamberlain even supported Churchill, the crucial bombings in 1940. So we all know that. On May 28th, this fateful date, when some of the members of the cabinet wanted to make a separate peace with Germany. Um, but uh, speaking about current leaders that you, anon this anonymous leaders that you, you, you uh, uh, almost mentioned, <laughs> uh, I think there's a problem is they are, they are afraid of making decisions that will have historical impact. They were not born for that. They are managers. Just look at, uh, I can use names, Olaf Scholz. You know, imagine six months ago, anybody would tell him that his main job as a chancellor would be to decide when and how to send German tanks to fight Russians in Kharkiv. He would probably die in his sleep. <laughs> 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 so it's the, I think, oh, president of this country, Emmanuel Macron, so he he's enjo enjoys his, you know, position of going between. So between Russians, Americans, you know, Europeans. These people are afraid of Ukraine winning the war because it will be a totally different world and they don't know what, what will be their role in this world. So because it's the, imagine, the Ukraine victory changes everything. You know, you already see this as a new spiritual leadership coming from there. So, and, you know, as was, you know, Russian internet, in internet you know, joke that it's, we live in a very strange time where many politicians turned into clowns and a comedian has become a hero. <laughs> so... Thank you very much for your patience, and thank you very much all the three participants. May I express an idea uh, which uh, was submitted to me by some French lawyers uh, who think that we should organize on an international level a kind of public hearings about Ukraine, uh, 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 Russian crime crimes committed in Ukraine. The model would be Russell's tri tribunal, but of course uh, not mainly French, but international, in order to not to make justice, med but to, to, to make these crimes public. Um, I think that maybe one sh should, s people present here could take uh, such, a, such an initiative, because time of justice is long, maybe we shall never uh, have a chance to judge Vladimir Putin personally, like it was the case of Milosevic and other war criminals, but at least these crimes should caught more public attention. And that is very important in order to support, continue to support Ukraine. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Alors, pour le déjeuner, ce sera comme l'an dernier.